A few more days pass for the skeleton crew, in which they mostly wait for their armour and such things to be finished. When the armour is finally delivered and everyone is in squeaky clean gear, they can claim as their own, and no longer ripped from the dead. <laughs> While Drunk still has the baby socks from session one, Every- Fuck yeah, I forgot about them. <laughs> yeah. Everyone begins to plan for the actual road trip they have to take in order to get the necromancer home. All the skeletons seem very keen on the pocket frigate, as travelling by air would make a lot of things easier than having to travel by land and through so many countries. Everyone heads off, except Auspicious Skeleton, who is sitting in his new armour and writing a letter in the dining room of the inn. After getting placed in the friend zone, the skeleton had gone back to the blacksmith and asked for a few modifications to his armour in which the blacksmith was more than happy to do as a chance to even further his skills, and was paid a little more coin in order to do so. Now his helmet had an exact metal copy of the horns that the female minotaur had, as perhaps the blacksmith had gone to see for himself and get a good look at her. Aww. Aww. Poor skeleton. Due to this peeping tomfoolery and a string of very high skill checks, he was also able to etch into the breastplate of the armour an almost flawless recreation of the Minotaur woman from the waist up, and the door of his armour, for his familiar, rests right where her and his heart would be. Aww. Oh. Auspicious was satisfied with the armour on delivery, and put it on while everyone else tried not to make a comment on it too loudly or find somewhere else to go. At the pocket airship, the skeletons all gaggled down the harbour with Millie and came upon the air dock at which it lay, and they found the bosun Petty Pearl at work, doing their final checks on gear and loading up any more supplies they may need. Rowdy Skeleton took the lead, and began to try and make a deal for the travel. Millie, on the other hand, was talking to the rest of the female sailors and showing off her leg, and the group of them got into a discussion of replacement body parts. Everything was going quite well in the negotiations, until Rowdy mentioned chicken, the horses, and the cows. Whoa, 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 hang on. There's no way I'm letting farm animals on my ship again. No way. The hold smelled awful and it took weeks to clean. She then took out the speaking orb from her pocket and confirmed this with Captain McBust. Rowdy relayed this to the skeletons and an argument lasting almost 15 minutes ensued in which Auspicious was adamant about chicken and his cows while Drunk was saying just to sell the animals and find a good home for them. Oh, you couldn't do no. that. No. They've had the, they've they've had had the cows, cows since fucking, fucking day one. Yeah. Why did they even bring the cows? They just fall. And chicken, like, is OP as fuck. Yeah, chicken's pretty cool. Chicken's really cool. <laughs> Drunk then got an idea to try and get Harlow to convince Boson Betty Pearl. And in his theory, how could an aeronautical lesbian resist the buxom figure of an exotic lady with scars? Auspicious <laughs> 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 still at the inn, riding and talking with the innkeeper, roused Harla from her napping and told her what was going down. She teeter-tottered down the road towards the harbour, and after some time arrived, yawning and trying to fluff her hair back to life. What's going on, guys? She murmured and looked around mutely. Drunk gave her the rundown and what he wanted her to do. And she snorted, tying her hair back into a braid as she spoke. Millie was now showing the sailors the bit knife. They were quite enthralled with the idea. Harlow walked up to Betty Pearl and did her best to convince her to allow the entire crew on board. But not even she would budge the old veteran sailor. And the whole thing got Harlow in a rather bad mood. What a cantankerous woman, she muttered as she walked back over to the skeletons told them what Pearl told her, and then went back to the inn with more of a stomp in her step. The skeletons were devising another plan when Rowdy gets a brilliant idea. Rowdy wanted to speak to the manager and went full Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I need to fucking shop that together with the Karen her on the skeleton head. Yeah. If I haven't put that into the video, I feel <laughs> I rolled a pickpocket the speaking orb from her pants in broad daylight with everyone around, her front pocket and her back is to him. To say he failed spectacularly would be an understatement. <laughs> As he moved forward and stuck his hand under her pocket, Pearl's back seized and her head jerked up harshly from reading her clipboard. What you doing there? Nothing, <laughs> murmured Rowdy. Boson Betty Pearl was not one to take insults to her station and rounded on Rowdy with both her fists raised as combat began immediately. God. Really, <laughs> <you're> <laughs> gonna get gun knocked in by a lesbian. Don't. 
Rowdy managed to duck and dodge the first two swings, but the uppercut on his chin sent him reeling back into the other skeletons, and Millie turned around to see what all the noise was about. I'll be damned if you or any other of your sticky finger gang make it onto the Queen Fairy, Betty Pearl roared, and threw her clipboard at Rowdy, who ducked again but made no moves to further the combat. Drunk Skeleton was besides himself. What are you doing, Rowdy? The thespi- the thespians? <laughs> Sky Pirate thespians? We would have been on their ship for weeks. You ruined everything! <laughs> <laughs> This row followed the same vein all the way back to the inn, with Drunk hurling abuse at Rowdy, who scrunched up his shoulders and sucked his skull as far into his leather armour as he could. Like, there was a good setup for them. Like, we, yeah. had, we had a full session with yeah. fucking, what do you call her, Kyla going to the Thessians? Yeah. Well then, since travelling by airboat full of women is off the table, I'm going to go look at the stables. Drunk screamed into the sky, fists clutched in rage and he stomped off towards the stables to see about their carriage and what else they had in there. As Drunk kicked in the door and stomped in, he looked around for the man who ran Click Clack Inc, and he spied Johnny over in the corner, whittling on a piece of wood. Oi, you! Drunk yelled and pointed at Johnny. Johnny spooked and dropped his knife in wood, holding up his hands. What other carriages you have round here? Johnny quickly brushed off his pants of wood shavings and ran over. He began to tell Drunk about what he did to their carriage first, and then the other carriages he had for sale. Their original carriage had been reinforced in order to appease Auspicious, and make sure he didn't suck out Johnny's soul, and a lot of the wheels, doors and upper parts of the carriage were reinforced with thicker wood and thin sheet steel, plating it to make it tougher but not too heavy. The top parts had what looked like walls, where a first size being could duck and cover from incoming fire. Johnny also fixed a lot of the interior, after a rather large bullet caused a lot of spalling and put a large hole into two of the walls. Drunk, surprised yet satisfied at the improvements, nodded approvingly, and Johnny began to show him the other carriages for sale. At this time, the rest of the skeletons have shown up, including Auspicious. The rest of the normal carriages were nothing really to look at. Some two-seaters, wagons and the like, nothing too far off from what they already had. However, when Johnny got to the armoured carriages, then things got a little interesting. The smaller ones would not do much for the party since they were designed to keep VIPs safe along rides. They can only fit two to three people. The larger ones really caught the eye of the party. Three or four axled behemoths that were drawn by six to eight draft horses, had gun ports, spotting positions and armoured rear outlets for keeping an eye on the roads. Uh, that doesn't sound too bad. Doesn't this sound is a nice eye. alternative. Can, if you can't go by air, I do like the idea of having gun turrets. Yeah, if you can't go yeah. by an armoured thespian ship, go by this. Yeah, this sounds pretty, like, a good alternative. Mm. The biggest, and Johnny's pride, was Bertha. Bertha was the largest in four axles, a fully custom suspension, and was sheet steel plated everywhere they could see. She needed a minimum of eight draft horses to move, but all the weight was on the axles, which did a good job of keeping most of the stress of the horses. Inside it was outfitted like a barracks. The walls were lined with flip down bunks that lay flat against the walls with the assistance of chains. A small stove was inside to keep it warm and the entire thing was enclosed. The rear of Bertha was like the rear gunner position of a bomber, lined with thick glass with a window that could be lowered so someone from the inside could shoot or stab out. On top was a single rotating lookout position with no top but the person on top just had to climb a small ladder and could perch up and see as the lookout and be relatively safe. Oh, see, this thing sounds like a fucking tank. It does sound like a fucking tank. It's missing a turret and whatnot, but like, you know, it sounds like a tank Tank, to me. yeah. A horse going back to tank, but it's it's a tank nonetheless. Can go faster than a tank? Nah, probably not with the horses. Old tank, yeah. Well, okay, old tanks, yeah. Like Like World World War War I tanks. tanks. Yeah, yeah. World War I tanks at what max speed was like, what, six miles an hour? Yeah. If even. 10 was like fucking (laughs) big. But World War II tanks can go pretty quick. They're going to go like. I'm not talking about World War II. Like, this is like medieval. So, like, World War I tanks. I'll go faster than that with eight horses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the horse would be better than that. The driver position could be accessed from a small door at the very front of Bertha but had a proper speaking tube to the interior. And, and, you could sleep inside of it, not having to be outside in the weather or cold or danger, and you can just bottle up inside. 
Johnny was quite proud of his creation, having poured a lot of his heart and soul into it. I'm going to have to fucking say about Garbo sorting us out with one of them in the West March <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but that sounds really fucking cool. I might want one. Alright, I just fucking want one. But as Johnny watched the skeletons walk around it, inside of it, admire it, he got a sinking feeling. Oh, oh no, you're not going to. Rowdy was already pulling out the writ from the directorate when Johnny asked this. And Johnny's face fell when he realised they were going to cash in on Bertha. Oh, <laughs> put your heart and soul into something. These boys just pull around and go, give me it for free. <laughs> give me a fucking tank. <laughs> give me a fucking tank. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. <laughs> oh, fuck. Not even the biggest tax break could heal the fact Bertha was worth hundreds of gold and took years to build, but was also afraid of both the skeletons and the directorate. In the end, the skeletons got Bertha, but a lot of them felt guilty because Johnny just had his head in his hands in the corner of the stable. So they all pulled together some gold, a fraction of Bertha's worth, and gave it to him, just to console the man. They also got some of the old Arderman's draft horses. When the army fled, they left most of their beasts of burden, and these tall monsters would do the trick for Bertha. They were a bit bitey though, so with a bunking on the noggin from a species, <laughs> with a stern talking to, they were wrangled and fitted to Bertha, while the original horses were hooked up to their original carriage. The whole party convened at the inn, with a species handing a letter to the innkeeper and the two exchanging a few words, and everyone else lugging their stuff off into the carriages. The cows were gathered and tied behind the original carriage, and chicken was more or less stabled inside the interior of the old carriage, with a happy little nest made inside for him. It took a while for him to figure out the door handle though, and first tried to coach him on it to some success. Afterwards, first hopped on top of the original carriage with a rifle, and was super pumped to be off in the road again, and drunk took the reins of the carriage after thunking around in the driver's seat. First saw this, and hopped down to sit beside him, laying her rifle across her lap and wagging her tail excitedly. Drunk gave her a piece of milky taffy to celebrate, but it got stuck to the roof of her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else piled into Bertha and got comfortable with Agile sitting up in the lookout position. Furious reached up to give his boot a playful smack, and when he did, something odd happened. Somewhere in Bertha, a small honk was heard, and Furious looked around, while above him Agile roared, what the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> Furious looked up, then down, and in his hands was Agile's rifle. Furious stared down at the rifle in his hands, flabbergasted, while Agile looked down from his little sling chair at Furious. The two stared in silence. As Furious handed back Agile his rifle, and Agile held it close to his chest, a word was not spoken about the incident, and Auspicious gave his new steeds a chuck of the teeth to get them moving. His fox familiar was also out and sitting on the seat next to him, swaying slightly in chin with Auspicious as Bertha heaved forward. To be fair, Bertha was very well balanced, and the horses didn't seem to have much trouble hauling her, despite being a monster of a travel carriage. People came out to see her as they travelled past, the old carriage toddling behind, and Agile waved out to them. All the skeletons were also wearing their special helmets and masks, so they didn't even look like skeletons unless you got too close. Fucking and then you see one with a gimp <laughs> mask. <laughs> People in the town didn't even know who they were. <laughs> Fuck Gimp me. mask. As armour changed and skeletal features were hidden, Auspicious thought back to his letter, postmarked for a day after they left, and he gave a great sigh as the sunlight glinted off the horns of his helmet. Drunk found how he liked to hold the reins and his mind drifted off to the sky lesbian pirates and the adventures they would have had. <laughs> Furious poked his head out of the window and watched the grass go by. Rowdy sat at the rear of Bertha and waved at first. He waved back cheerily while picking at the taffy on her mouth. <laughs> Agile just enjoyed his little lookout hole and swiveled back and forth on his little sling chair. Harla and Kyla put their feet up and lay back in the seating inside Bertha while Omen and Chiron chattered about what the elves were going to be like. Millie asked Rowdy what happened about travelling by air. Uh, we couldn't come to an agreement. He tried to pickpocket the fucking bosun! <laughs> Drunk screamed from the rear of the little convoy, and the rage of his voice carried all the way through to Millie in the middle of Bertha. 
Then, somehow, the skeleton started talking about Pirates of the Caribbean. (laughs) (laughs) Auspicious, rowdy, furious, drunk and agile began to regale the living members of the story about the adventures of Captain Jack Sparrow. And they all sat together listening intently to the skeleton barking bits of the story from all over the convoy. And they sometimes had to ask the skeletons to repeat certain parts or explain certain things in the stories. So, this Davy Jones, is he real? Omen asked, her eyes wide. Face tentacles and all? Millie had a bad flashback to the fish and muttered, tentacles and the screeching. Aye, and he waits all he sinks beneath the waters. Riley said in a creepy, guttural voice. Agile flipped upside down and hung in front of Omen from his sling seat. Do you fear death, Mrs. Omen? <laughs> <laughs> he purred. Oh, shut up, she growled and pushed Agile away. He swung back up to his seat as everyone else laughed. They got through all the movies, or tales, as they told them, and began to discuss how the ones after the first weren't really as good. <laughs> And confused the shit out of everyone else. Yeah, you know what one was good shit? The one, the fourth one was... No, the fucking... third one was from the third. I like the first and the second. Look, let's not talk about it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Everyone knows the first Captain of the... Pa- uh, ca- pa- fucking Paris the Caribbean yeah, movie was fucking beast. It was beast. <laughs> it was beast. I really like the second one as well. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop saying that. Like, it was beast and yeah. red pill <laughs> as fuck. I can't stop saying that. We're like anything though. <laughs> Uh, okay so the first one was outstanding the second one I kind of see what they were trying to do the second one felt like it was like it didn't really do anything no I liked the second one no I'm sorry I mean the third one it was shit it was more just like a connection almost to the next movie it felt like it was I didn't watch after the second one I'm not gonna lie oh I did watch the third one halfway through then I walked out of the movie Uh, and then the one about the mermaids was shit to make in like 2010 I don't remember that one. It, it was not. Look, anyway, enough of this. Let's keep going. First was fast asleep next to Drunk, snoring loudly and leaning against his shoulder. Drunk kept having to grab her rifle and put it back in her lap from time to time as the hours passed on. Night eventually fell. Horses were tethered out to rest and eat. Tea was made inside. Dinner was had and all the living fell asleep. Except first. She never even woke up when they stopped. Just snored in the bench seat. The skeletons began to play cards as Suspicious just hung out in the driver's seat of Bertha. The little lantern holding the ember of the flame spoke up. You doing okay, buddy? Auspicious shrugged. Hey, buddy, it's going to be okay. We're going off on another adventure. Who knows? You may meet someone now. Orler, the ancient god of fire, had this weird dad vibe going on. And you could almost picture him grilling steaks and sandals. Auspicious felt a different presence come down beside him. And Orler's flame gave a flutter. Oh, hey Melanie. Melanie, the goddess of love, sat down beside Auspicious and the two sat there in silence for a few moments. And she drummed her fingers on her knees. Melanie was fair, but not overly beautiful. Wearing a simple blue sundress and no shoes. Her toes flexing on the wood of Bertha as her auburn hair flowed around her head. Wait, hold up here. Is Garpo like fucking Quentin Tarantino when it comes to feet? <laughs> <laughs> tell me the, <laughs> tell me you know, you know, I'm not the only one getting this vibe here right? you could tell she was uncomfortable about the whole thing and a real air of awkwardness surrounded them like a cloud so I just wanted to come down and check up on you you have a lot of people running confused you know the undead normally don't get involved with love yet alone can love and while your buddy drunk got married No one is quite sure how to cope with the vibe you're giving off. Again, auspicious shrugs, and his familiar pokes his head out from the doggy door inside his armour. The last time we felt this kind of woe, a guy genocided like an entire country. So I wanted to come down to make sure you weren't feeling like wanting mass destruction. (laughs) (laughs) Oh come on now, Melanie. He isn't like that. Order piped up, and the little flame fluttered angrily. Orler, this kind of thing is unprecedented. We're taking this very seriously. Anyway, I just want you to know things can get better. Try to keep your chin up, okay? And Melanie held up on her slender arms for a hug. Auspicious stared at her for a moment, then leaned in to be hugged. She hugged him tightly and whispered into his skull, Try not to murder everything, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone needs that. And it's like, 
Stop killing fucking everything. <laughs> Please be nice. Please. Please. <laughs> Before she was gone in an instant, and he was being hugged by no one. Such drama, Orler murmured, and a speciously dropped a little piece of salted cow in for the flame to devour. Agile, having seen and heard what's going on, rounded the opposite side of Bertha and tried to contact Fintry, his own patron goddess. He wasn't sure how to do it, so he just bowed his head and body and tried to talk inwardly to her about him wanting to talk, and was at this for a few minutes before he felt the presence next to him. What you thinking about? The great mouthless elf woman was leaning down next to him and spooked the shit out of Agile when he turned his head and saw her massive face. <laughs> she laughed, the sound echoing in his skull, before she sat down in the grass, her long slender legs stretched out and her eyes smiling. Even seated, she was taller than Agile standing. Ah, <laughs> hey, thanks for um showing up. Agile coughed into his gloved fist. Could you tell me about me when I was alive? Um, oh sure, I suppose. Fintry smiled again with her eyes and began to regale Agile about his long past life. Agile had been a lady killer, a fantastic dancer, and had been able to slither into any space that needs slithering into when it came to robbery. Oh, come on, you don't find that the garbo started blasting that there. I was a highwayman. <laughs> I was born. Oh, what was it like again? <laughs> what is it? What's the song? I know, I know what you mean. You know... <laughs> He had been contacted by the very same people he was partied up with now, minus Furious, to take out an evil necromancer that was plaguing the world when he was alive. Ironic, eh? Fentry says with a giggle, and Agile snorts as best as a skeleton can. Fentry continued on to say that when he slipped inside to sneak past the complicated puzzles and hard-to-reach places to let other party members in, he failed to notice a trap. It seems your luck just ran out. Poof! You were dead, she said with a head tilt, and waggled her slender feet in the grass. What? What do you mean I just died? Agile said aghast. Well, you just failed to see the trap at your feet after letting the rest of the party in, and you were crushed to death. Quite the terrible end for you, I must admit. Okay, so how did everyone else die? Beats me. Fentry bumped her elbow against Agile. What? Are you a goddess? Don't you see everything and are omnipotent? It was her turn to snort. I can't be buggered to watch everything. I have things I want to do too. Agile was beside himself. Like what? I do like my bubble baths. For fuck's sake. <laughs> and she laughed again, giving Agile's helmet a rustle and it fucked everything up. So he had to readjust his mask and helmet. When he did, he looked around. Fintry was gone and the sun was beginning to rise. Back in Taliab, the morning post was delivered a few hours later and at the big spoon... A letter was delivered. A minotaur woman opened it from up in her room and she read it aloud. By the time you'll read this, I'll be gone. It's a shame you couldn't join us, or rather, myself. But as long as you're happy. I worked a deal with the owners of the inn. You will be welcome to breakfast any time, since you said you never get to go. I wish you the best of luck. And until next time, auspicious. That same woman got up, put on her town clothes, and walked out into the morning air. She went to the same inn and the Serbians knew who she was. She was given the whole menu once again. She ate it all, once again. When she was done, she sat there, drinking coffee for what seemed like an hour, staring at where that skeleton sat only a few days before. At the same time, Bertha came to a halt in the town of Cancitra, and that very same skeleton hopped down from his seat, applied the brake, patted the draft horse on the bottom, and stared back down the road that led to Taliab. Time. Like.